time for our uh, panel session, um, which I didn't want to understand, is about scientific literacy. Um, so rather than me going on anymore, I'll just hand over to Peter from the Science Media Centre in just a second. The only other thing I'll say is that uh, we have a bucket for women's refuge. Um, we'll just start that being passed through the audience. Uh, so if you could just uh, um, donate if you feel you um, are able to, um, once it comes around to you, and then just keep it circulating through the room and we can pick it up afterward, okay? Um, all right, that's everything for me, so I'll pass things over to Peter now. Hey, thanks for that. What an amazing day so far. I've just been blown away by the quality of some of the presentations. I've been about three skeptics conferences, and I think this is the best so far, so good work, guys. Um, yeah, my name is Peter Griffin. I'm from the Science Media Centre, uh, which is a unit of the Royal Society of New Zealand. Uh, some would consider another dead horse that's getting flogged a bit. But um, uh, I'm looking particularly at science literacy in the media among our journalists. So we don't have any science reporters left in the country. We have general reporters covering science. So that is a major issue. When we were kicking around what we wanted to talk about, science literacy kept coming up. So we are going to. Uh, have some questions uh, and, and discussion about that, but we don't want to shortchange you guys because on the website here we're going to talk about the state of skepticism as well, and I think that's really important to, to kick off with. Um, what we're also going to do is, is because I heard over the break that um, you know a number of people just didn't realise that we had Pamela all the way from the states here, um, so we do have two international guests here. So as part of the introduction, I'm going to get everyone to reintroduce themselves. So we know exactly where everyone's coming from and their background. I've had the pleasure of working with two people on the panel here through the Sidewalls network that I edit, sidewalls.co.nz, so Susie and Al are contributors to, to that network, and, and, which is one of the biggest science world networks in, in Australasia. But just to kick off, when, when, when you guys do introduce yourself, I want, to give, I want you to give a little bit of a vision statement on where you think skeptic, the skeptics movement is. And we can do this geographically as well in America, in Australia. Susie's got experience in a lot of her, her career in Britain as well. There's been some interesting developments there, so maybe you might want, want to reflect that, Susie, of course, here in New Zealand as well. But just to give you a bit of perspective on that, if we try to think about skeptic groups around the world, and we have great access to, to them over the internet. Just two weeks ago, uh, interesting development in India. One of the leading skeptics in that country was assassinated, shot dead on his morning walk. And we haven't got enough information there to, to suggest that um, you know, Dr. Narendra the Volkar was actually killed because of his skeptic beliefs. But um, he was known for debunking supernatural claims and he had received death threats over numerous years as a result of this. In his uh, obituary uh, last week, they said, his goal was to drive scientific skepticism into the heart of India, a country teeming with gurus, babas, and godmen. So, I mean, the, the types of, we're all here really, I hope, for something more than just our interest uh, in this movement and being skeptics. We're actually hopeful that science literacy will grow in society, that evidence-based policy, all those things we've talked about today, will actually start to take hold. So I'm um, interested in the, in the panel sort of kicking off with, um, with their views on skepticism and we can do this geographically. Let's go with Pamela down here. Wow, I, I come to you with a microphone that isn't particularly loud. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, now this is working. Um, I, I flew here from the middle of the United States and I actually started Monday at Dragon Con uh, in the city of Atlanta. So um, while I was there, there was a skeptics chat as part of this event that had well over 60,000 people, including stormtroopers in attendance. And in this mix of reality and paranormal and science fiction and fantasy, the skeptics tried to get their voices heard. 
And I think one of the things that broke me a bit is the American skeptics movement right now is extraordinarily fractured, broken. And, and the causes of this have nothing to do with our belief in using empirical evidence to define our reality. The brokenness has to come, has to do with gender issues, it has to do with discrimination, it has to do with harassment. I'm tired of seeing female skeptics crying at conferences. That shouldn't happen. I'm tired of hearing about legal cases because women have been raped by prominent speakers. These things shouldn't be happening in this community. When, when I was offered the opportunity by Gold to come down, it was just a passing comment in, in an email exchange we were having, hey, are you, are you happy to be free? I, I jumped at the opportunity to come down here. Because I remember when I came to Tam Oz, and I think it was 2010, it was a TAM that was filled with speaker after speaker talking about how we're going to get rid of the consumer products that aren't good, how we're going to get people to think more scientifically, how we're going to do things to make people more aware of biases. And it wasn't caught up in the, is there a harassment policy because we really need one. Um, being here is a breath of fresh air. And I, I have to apologize for the state of my nation as I look at a country that's about to go into a third war and that is cutting science funding, is cutting science education funding, and with the skeptics movement that instead of fighting to well, help science is instead in fighting. I have received multiple emails in the past month from prominent male skeptics saying, I didn't do this illegal thing I'm being accused of. I should never get emails like that. Because things like that should never be a question in the leaders of our community. So I guess what I'd say is, I don't know what happened in America, but as a community, we can do better. We need to focus on doing and educating and not on hate and not on discrimination because those questions shouldn't even come up because we should be the better example. One of my first skeptical icons was Dr. Karen Stolzner, who's possibly one of the most influential Australian skeptics out there in the media in terms of contributing to some all how um, In terms of Australia, well, the thing that's been uppermost in my mind in terms of skepticism is the fact that we have an election. I'm looking at tweets from friends at home telling me that they're checking out the sausage sizzles that are available as they go down to the polling booths in order to vote. And of course, science is on many skeptics' minds, health policies on many skeptics' minds. I ended up interviewing a senator where just before the interview, I didn't put this to air, but I could hear him whispering to his aides, no, no, it's okay, she's a skeptic, no, no, that doesn't mean what you think it means, it's okay. She's be more pro-science, it's okay, but I can't, it's okay. That's an interesting thing to catch from a senator. Um, and this particular senator was about um, challenging anti-vaccination attitudes, and it was from a particular party that I, didn't often assume would be the kind of people that would be challenging anti-vaccination um, uh, claims out there. And yet it was a very interesting month. It was the month of May in Australia. Uh, the Sunday Telegraph, uh, due to Claire Harvey, had started up a massive campaign called No Jab, No Play. Questions were being asked in Parliament. It was recorded in Hansard with a number of politicians from all sides of the floor had seen saying that they did not want to have children dying due to diseases that could be prevented. Uh, there are lots of different groups out there in skepticism. The diversity is huge. Some I don't agree with in terms of tactics, some I do agree with, and some I plain don't know because I've been focusing most of my energies on looking at science communication over the last few years, mostly because I'm studying psychology and because I'm studying mainstream media. And the skeptics don't have much of a hold in mainstream media. However, there are lots of people who are skeptically minded or supportive of skeptics in certain ways. 
who are influencing the media. So in terms of uh, how things are going in Australia, all I have to say is that just because a particular politician married a New Zealand woman doesn't necessarily mean that I should be voting for them. <laughs> and I sincerely hope that the results will end up being pro-science and pro-health, no matter what happens in terms of Australia going to the polls. My fingers are unskeptically crossed, which is something I do do on occasion. <laughs> I'm Susie Wiles and I'm a microbiologist um, with an interest in infectious diseases and things that grow in the dark. And um, I'm kind of, I'm passionately, uh, I have a daughter and I'm kind of interested in how kids perceive scientists and sort of stereotypes of science amongst children and things, so I might be kind of dragging her out doing some things with her. Um, so, state of scepticism. I don't, do you want me to talk about state of scepticism in New Zealand? So you, yeah, yeah. Okay, so well, I'll start with the UK. Um, I didn't actually know much about scepticism when I lived in the UK. So I was a practicing scientist and uh, had my circle of friends and, you know, and I was an atheist and all of this kind of stuff. And I didn't really realise that there was a huge movement until I moved to New Zealand. And we needed to meet some friends and it was my husband who said, oh, there's a skeptic in the pub group. And I was like, who are they? And he went along and said, this is bad, you should come along. Um, and so we started going. And so it was sort of through that that I realised actually there was this movement called Skeptics. And yes, I was one of them. I hadn't kind of realised that before. Um, and then I started to take an interest in the things that were going on in the UK. And what seems to me from a distance in the UK is that science um, is just an interest in science and, um, and sort of acceptance of science and, and scientists being in the public. And it's just exploding. You know, there have been some really fantastic reviews of, um, of uh, portrayals of science and scientists in the media that has led to things like the BBC being told they need more women to present things. You know, so there's all sorts of stuff we've got, you know, superstar scientists like Brian Cox presenting things. So it seems like um, things over there are actually really healthy. And from my ears, there is nothing of um, this horrendous schism that's appearing in the US appearing in the as far as I'm aware, there are no prominent skeptics in the UK who have been accused of this possible. Well, so is it, one of them has been very bad. One of them is, is fueling this thing, yes. but it's not. He's not fueling it in the UK, which is interesting because his target is is an American, is an American feminist, essentially. So I find that whole thing really horrible that there is this particular person who is fueling it. But the movement in the UK doesn't seem to be being particularly affected by it. And so, um, if that makes sense. So it's kind of quite separate, even though one of the ringleaders is, is from the UK. And then we've got things like um, amazing authors like Simon Singh, you know, doing incredible things, writing books, and, and the guy who did this, the Greek Geek Manifesto, you know, all of this is kind of coming out of the UK. Um, in terms of the state of skepticism in New Zealand, I kind of felt like I'm talking for you guys. I mean, it seems like we actually have an incredibly um, a great group of people. You know, there's, there's, we, we have Gold who started Skeptics in the Pub, and that seems to be doing very well. And each centre has their own, their different things that they do, um, but they all seem to be kind of healthy. I mean, I'm surprised living in Auckland we don't get more people Skeptics in the Pub. We have like 500 people now in our group, but we get, I don't know, 40 people or so come in regularly, 40, 50. Um, so I'm always kind of like, well, where are the other ones? Uh, although, thank goodness they don't come because we wouldn't fit them in the pub. But that's another matter. Yeah. Uh, and I've certainly not experienced, I mean, I mean as a, we don't seem to have many women in our group, and I can't speak for any of the other ones, and it would be nice to get, and, and, and again, talking about the cultural thing, you know, we don't have very many, you know, everybody's basically white, almost everybody's white. And so how do we get more diversity into our groups? I don't know. Um, and that's something that we have to sort of tackle. But we seem a fairly, I don't know, a fairly kind of solid group, it seems quite nice, really. And, and although as a, as a woman at Skeptics in the Pub, I've had a few strange, you know, geeky men come up and try and chat me up and stuff, which is kind of hilarious because my husband goes too, and it seems like most people don't realise that I'm married to him. But anyway, that's sort of by the by. Um, there doesn't seem to be any, I don't feel like we've had any aggressive you know, things and that, anything that makes me feel hugely uncomfortable. 
So that I can call it peace for, but I don't know what the other centres are like. Um, and I think we, I feel a little bit jealous of some of the stuff that's going on in Australia, like the Friends of Science and Medicine, and I feel we've got a lot to learn from what they've been doing. You know, there, they've got a couple of anti-vax, sorry, I'm going on a bit, but they've got a couple of anti-vax um, organisations that have just done fantastic stuff, and I feel like we need to up our game. So when I, I'm going to talk to you guys tomorrow, and my talk is going to be about how we should up our game and some of the things that we can maybe do, because I think we're, do, we're doing really well, and we thought we could always do more. Um, so that's going to be my challenge.
we've been very lucky and fortunate in this country that we have a very unified sort of skeptic movement. So when you do make a noise, it's noticeable. The Ben Spoon Award, it gets media coverage. You know, Vicky has for years been uh, widely quoted in the media. But it seems to me that the strongest this sort of movement is and skeptic movements are around the world, we still have a major, a major problem out there. And that sort of uh, feeds into what uh, we've heard a bit about today, which is science literacy, which we're all really interested in here. And, um, and what actually is science literacy and how do we measure it and how are we doing? And it's that thing that Alf was talking about, about science communication. How do you test the efficacy of it? It's really difficult. Some countries are trying to do this in a methodical way, and I um, just want to mention the Australian Academy of Science poll that came out in July. This was Auspol did it on their behalf. I think about 2,000 people were polled. And it found that one third of Australians do not know how long it takes for the Earth to orbit the sun. <laughs> and before you, before you laugh, they haven't tested New Zealand, so I don't know how we do. <laughs> Worse than that, only two thirds of 18 to 24 year olds got it right, down from three quarters in 2010. So look, this is one poll that, um, albeit you know, a fairly robust company is, is doing on a regular basis. But I'm interested in the panel's views on how important this sort of stuff is, and maybe if you start with the panel again, because the US, they do so much of this sort of testing, pure research, everyone is trying to find out the level of scientific literacy. So, so one thing I, I want all of you to understand is, is when they develop the tests that get used to check for these misconceptions, they, they typically aren't open-ended questions. They typically are questions that have a series of multiple choice answers, and the options that are given are designed to pick up on these are the most typically given wrong answers, so that if someone doesn't read the question well, they're very likely to mark the wrong thing. So if you remember back to that professor you hated most in university because their multiple choice tests were evil because it was so easy to read quickly and get, the, yeah, that's the type of tests that leads to results like this. I write them occasionally. Um, but but this, this doesn't change the fact that we have nations that are slowly falling behind the developing world in our understanding of the universe. We are stressing multiculturalism, we are stressing um, understanding, we are stressing acceptance, and we are forgetting that sometimes there are things that are right, and sometimes there are things that are wrong. And science is one of those areas that doesn't have two sides. F equals MA, there isn't another option. It's not turtles all the way down, it's the Big Bang. <laughs> and, and so when we're teaching science, we need to, to do a better job at getting students to have a more conceptual understanding and have a more rigorous understanding. In, in America, we're struggling with a variety of different problems, one being that the No Child Left Behind program left behind all the children. <laughs> this, this, this program looked at schools, and I wish it was as funny as it sounded, but it's true. University professors have had to water down their classes in reaction to the fact that our students aren't properly prepared for college. And it, it's, it's because the tests aren't testing thought processes, or at least they weren't. We just changed our national standards to stress inquiry, so hopefully things will get better. But, but what they were testing, the, the teachers were just making sure that students could pass the exams, not making sure they understood the universe they lived in. And we need to try and understand what are we preparing our students for? Are we preparing them to pass some exam written by bureaucrats? Or are we preparing them to problem solve their ways through life? and in designing our nationalized curriculum. One thing that bothers me is so many nations in the world are following America's leadership and developing national standards. And this sun summer, while in Turku, Finland, I, I was in a teacher training program that had teachers from 13 different nations. And when we asked them, what are the things that are holding you back the most in teaching your students? They said over and over and over, having to teach to having to teach to the standards. 
because they can't teach their students to think. And we need to figure out how to redesign our education systems to teach critical thinking, to teach inquiry, to teach concepts rather than facts. And that's going to require throwing up the standards and starting back over again. is by Dr. Will Grant, who happens to be writing for the conversation, I'm going to mention this tomorrow in my talk, uh, to the Science Academy's uh, poll. Uh, Dr. Will Grant is uh, a researcher, a lecturer of the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science at the Australian National University. He also happens to be, and don't quote me on this, but I think he is currently one of the acting co-presidents of the Australian Science Communicators Group over in Australia. And he sums it up as, well, this survey says very little, actually. They are bluntly belated concern trolling. Oh, no, find another power source. <laughs> if you want, I can give you the URL for this tomorrow, but I'm going to read out a section of it. Surveys at this time are, to put it bluntly, concern trolling. Scientists and the science interested can collectively gnash their teeth with very large groups of people who fail to grasp some rudimentary science fact. But it doesn't actually mean very much. We pretend that factoids are a useful proxy for scientific literacy, and that in turn, scientific literacy is a useful proxy for good citizenship. But there's simply no evidence that this is true. Now, the ability to uh, essentially rattle off a few facts doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to deep understanding of it. Surveys such as this have been used and criticised since their inception in 1989. The very first issue of the Journal of Public Understanding of Science, which would arguably have a readership with a vested interest in such outcomes, contained several entries commenting on the utility of such an exercise. And yet we still persist in using these surveys to berate the public for not knowing more. What they do is they keep the academics busy, they tick various grant recipient boxes, and make the general public feel more disillusioned about their scientific abilities. Um, the point that people should be grasping when they survey themselves is that 79% of respondents see the crucial relationship between science and the economy. Little 79% of our politicians make the same connection and act on it appropriately. That's the real test. And as soon as um, that pops up, there we go. You can click on that link for yourself if you hop onto Twitter. Just look for the NZSkepcom hashtag and you can find it for yourself. I'd like to underline what she said about the grant recipient checkbox. One of the reasons these surveys exist is so that people like me, when we apply for funding, can say, here's the reason you need to fund me. It's the reality. We do surveys to prove that what we do for science outreach is necessary. Because teaching science, because it's cool and awesome and explains the universe, isn't sufficient. You have to prove that the audience is dumb first. <laughs> <laughs> So we have a system, in, or we have a group in New Zealand who are actually doing some work in this space and unsurprisingly Peter Ruckman is one of the drivers behind this. So at the Leggins Institute um, in Auckland they have what's called the Leggins Science Program. And so this is um, Leggins Education Network or something. Um, so they have a couple of classrooms um, and every day um, groups come, classes come in and spend a day doing some science. Uh, and what's really interesting, the way, the way they've done it is that they have a particular thing that they are interested in improving their science literacy around. And so because of Peter Blackman and it's the Ligons Institute, it's around obesity and diabetes and maternal health. So it have the effects of all these things and also the effects on maternal health and even baby development. And so the program is designed depending, I mean, they've got these amazing um, uh, teachers, I guess, who, who, who design the program um, and who, who teach it. Um, the kids come and they, they run the PCRs and they do journals and they do all sorts of kind of science, really. And then at lunchtime they have a session called Meet the Scientist where um, the three scientists come in and you get ten minutes to talk to the kids about science. And actually that's the bit of the day the kids love the most. 
because it completely blows their mind that they have these people who they didn't think were scientists um, come in and say, you know, this is what I'm doing, and they try and get a range, so every day they try and get like, one PhD student, one uh, data researcher, sometimes a clinician, so, so they kind of try and vary it to show them all the different paths into science and then what people are doing. And initially this is just an academia which given the state of academia is probably not a good thing, but you know, it would be nice if they actually had some scientists and say, oh, I'm a business, I'm a business outside. So, but what they're doing is they're interested in, um, they're actually looking at the kids, um, the surveying the kids' attitude to diabetes and food and stuff like that. Um, both, uh, and they have two groups. They have groups of kids who haven't been through their program and then groups of kids who are doing their program. And in the long term, they want to see, so actually uh, the kids who've been intervened with are the kids who've come and done some science and learned about the fact that, you know, they're all going to die of diabetes and so they should stop eating badly. Um, is that going to change the diabetes rates and, and, the, and the way the kids perceive food and their families perceive food? Um, and the initial things are looking kind of positive, so there does seem to be, you know, within the first so many months, the kids have remembered that, you know, maybe they should be talking to their parents about not eating all that shit. Um, but, you know, we've got, these are also, the, the programs are directed at um, low desire kids. So there is the thing that nobody mentions, which is kind of poverty, and actually that, you know, it's very difficult to afford to buy really nice fruit and veg when you're poor, but we'll kind of put that aside. Um, so they are thinking that in the short term it looks like it might be having an effect. Whether that actually has an effect long term, uh, we have no idea. But at least this group is trying to address that. But they're very focused. Um, and there are certainly groups overseas who are taking what the Lens Science Program is doing and replicating it and saying that this looks awesome, we're going to do this in other countries. And what would be really nice would be to see New Zealand doing this uh, in other places. Um, but there does seem to be a little bit of protectionism and turf, turf protection going on, which is kind of sad. Um, so I think we've actually, we do have a few groups who are in this space um, and we look like doing a good job. Okay. We're going to throw it open you know, very shortly for people to, to ask questions of the panel. I just wanted to uh, carry on with that theme. Elf talked a lot about education today. Um, you have kids coming through Kaido, you have to you. you presenting to all the time, you go out to schools as well from time to time. Things have swung, swung back to science literacy in New Zealand. It's hot at the moment, so Peter Blackman is on about it. It's the 11th challenge that underpin all those other science challenges. What would you like to see from an educational point of view? What actually works that could, you think could be rolled out on a wider scale? It's a horrible question. Um, <laughs> I guess, so there's three things I'd like to say. So the, the the first is that what I would like to see change is, uh, so in terms of success rates in New Zealand in science and math, we don't have the bell curve, which is what most countries have when the bell curve shifts. We have two humps, have one of those road signs that goes like this, um, and you have your, essentially, uh, and I'm making last generalizations here and I apologize for that, but you have your Pākehā and Asian students in the 70 to 90 percent range, and then you have your 40 to 60 percent range, which are typically Māori and Pacific students. What I would like to see and be really happy with is just to see that low tail get up a little bit. That would that would be enough for me. Um, if we could get it equal, that would be that would be fantastic. But um, I'm not sure that's going to happen in my lifetime. Um, and, you know, Chris, I'll live forever. Um, I would really like to see that tail change, and I think that tail is, is poverty and like all sorts of different things. However, on the and so on the similarly negative side of the coin, we have a similar problem with America with NCA encouraging teaching to the standard rather than teaching the topic. And you talk to any science teacher, and this is what they're forced to do. It's, it's the reality of their job, but unfortunately you don't have a lot of room to innovate. That said, there are individual pockets of awesomeness amongst teachers where despite um, how well I would have some of them be damned with the standards um, and are doing really amazing things. And as someone that's worked with a lot of first year science and math students coming into Victorian universities, the, the difference in these students walking in the door is like chalk and cheese. I can make one conversation with them and I can tell which bin they fall into. And if you put them through our hundred level physics lab, the ones that finish the lab, yeah, they're the ones with the teachers that teach how to learn and how to think, not the ones that teach the standards, not kids with all the credits and all the excellences and all the scholarships. Um, there are 
this is happening, we know how to do it, we, we do know how to teach this well. I don't know if it's scalable to a national standard. Um, it requires, to do it really well, it requires a huge amount of effort from the students and the teachers. And the ones that do it get a lot out of it, but I don't know whether you can expect it. I don't think it's appropriate to expect that for every science teacher to spend all their evenings and all their weekends innovating for the sake of their students. They have lives as well. <laughs> um, the final thing is, before we get back to Kylie, is what I would really like to know is, so we have this 30%, so this way. So we skip a year down the line, how many people from that group are going to remember the 30% statistic over how long it does actually take the Earth go around the sun? I think more people will remember the 30% statistic than actually find out the correct piece of information. But that's just me. <laughs> Well, 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 she. I need a scientist to help me. You scientist? <laughs> I'm still learning to be a scientist. <laughs> well, uh, just touching on this in regards to getting national curriculum, that's something that we're currently attempting to do in Australia. Critical thinking is in pockets in Australia. For example, in my state, Western Australia, I have contributed to the writing of and writing resources and even the teaching of a course called Philosophy and Ethics, which is taught exclusively, well, fairly exclusively, to the final two years of high school in Western Australia. Uh, some year 10s do it, I don't know, you have equivalent school system here, 10s, 11s, and 12s, or you have a year 13. Yeah, okay. So sort of the, the last two years of high school, maybe slightly lower. And this is a university entrance subject, although students can learn the subject and not use it for university entrance if they wish to. It's a fairly popular subject, it's growing over time. The problem is, is finding teachers who are qualified in order to teach critical thinking. Now, um, in terms of the hopes of it, of a course like the one that's in Western Australia and in the state of Victoria, in um, Australia, it being rolled out across the nation wide, there's a few hurdles. One that um, has always worried me is the fact that the skeptics in general never seem to be very interested in it, but I have noticed that a lot of scientists are interested in having this program uh, created nationwide. Uh, one particular group called Bridge 8 have created a number of videos that you can find online and I'll post them to them tomorrow and also the Federation of Australian Philosophy and Schools Association and I know that New Zealand has a similar sort of uh, secondary or tertiary philosophy and schools association too and they've had conferences over here for example representatives have uh, trained across the, across the ocean as it were. So, as a university teacher who tutors in introductory philosophy for undergraduates and having taught high school philosophy in this particular program in Western Australia, I see it as an encouraging move for Australia to start having critical thinking as a subject that are for all ages. And it is useful, certainly, to have more educators involved in sceptical endeavours, not only because it will enable us to find more allies in terms of encouraging critical thinking in schools, we can help us have voice, help us find resources, for example, but also to encourage more people to train in the field of philosophy, because that's what you need. You need a school if you want to go forth and teach it. And um, hopefully we can find more uh, unity over the years, touching wood again, fingers on sceptical across, but the national group and we'll see a value in encouraging a, a program that will go nationwide, and maybe that could be a of use to other countries as well. I, I, I'd like to point out something with the language that the two of them just used. Elle said, there's some amazing teachers out there who are doing incredible things with teaching inquiry and concepts, but it's really hard work and we can't expect all teachers to do that. Which is the equivalent of saying we can't expect all teachers to do a good job. And, and then Kylie went on to, to talk about how there's a shortage of qualified teachers, so you just can't expect good outcomes consistently. In what other career would we accept the fact that people don't do hard work and aren't qualified? And these are the people who are raising our next generation. We underpay them, overwork them, don't properly train them, and then we just start saying, eh. Yeah. Yeah, well, what's the university entry for education at most universities? It's like, you know, really, like, they talked about raising the bar for entering education at university. And, yeah, sometimes it seems like, you know, oh, I didn't get into engineering, didn't get into medicine. Oh, I might as well become a primary teacher now. Are you kidding? Have you tried being a primary teacher? I lasted two years and exhausted the heck out of me. <laughs> there are some truly amazing 
amazing teachers oh, out yeah. there. I'm personally terrified of middle schoolers. I admit this. And there's some amazing people out there who are doing an amazing job inspiring and changing lives. But we shouldn't settle with the rest of them. And this is a fundamental problem globally where why aren't they among our highest paid public servants? Why is the highest paid public servant in most states the football coach in the U.S.? <laughs> Any burning questions at this point for the panel? Is that actually true about football coaches? Yeah, so I'll find the infographic and post it when I'm done. In most states in the U.S., it's some sort of sporting coach is the highest paid state employee. It, there's a few cases of basketball coaches sneaking in, <laughs> but in general, it's football or basketball coaches with the highest paid individuals on the state salary in the states. And it's really recent um, stats as well. I just found it being the sports news sign, Deadspin is an infographic of all 50 states and the highest paid public employee in a lot of states. It's the football or basketball coach at the public university. <laughs> Jeez. Up the back there. Yeah. How can you um, evaluate if the critical thinking is being uh, it's been done in the classroom if you don't have a model or a tool to assess it? If it's not a national standard, what's the alternative model? Or so, so if you're teaching critical thinking skills, then when you're asking students to take national exams, you should be able to present them with a data set and ask them to do some sort of a set analysis. Um, th this is something that, that when I teach physics, I break my students with. Because the, the first 15 questions are usually multiple choice of death. The second page is, here's a scenario. Here's the data you got, or design the experiment to test this. And because you know what concepts that should have been covered, you know that they should be able to deal with certain types of data sets. And so by asking them to replicate them, national standard within the national testing scenario, not just writing essays, which we've now figured out the right computer code to grade, but also to do data analysis or uh, experimental design. These are all things that Science Olympiad covers. Why can't the national standards cover them in their testing as well? We know how to test this. Science Olympiad does it globally. Why are we only testing our honor students who participate in Olympiad? Any other questions? Yeah. Um, yep. Um, you mentioned uh, poverty as, as limiting the ability of the ground being to learn and understand science. Are there any other factors? Um, I'm thinking of the, for example, the traditional belief system. Uh, so, two things. The first is that. I don't think it limits the ability, I think it limits the exposure. That's, that, that's, that's it. And the second part is, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a, a really big factor that Afina and I have on about again and again and again, and it's this idea of farming, is that uh, it is, in, in the culture I grew up with, which my parents are both British, um, which is my fact that they as farmers in New Zealand anyway, um, it's, it's okay for me to succeed. If I succeed and the rest of the family doesn't, that, that's okay. My parents will still be proud of me. Um, with my Maori uh, Pacific friends, if they succeed and they leave their whānau behind, that's not success. That's not something to aspire to, that's failure. And it's a very different mentality because in Maori and Pacific culture, the whānau unit is what needs to succeed. So you can't just grab one. <laughs> you can't just get the best and the brightest. You, you, have, to, you have to work with the community. And I think in the past that's where a lot of a lot of programs have fallen over. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It can also be a self fulfilling policy in that if you don't have cultural engagement, particularly at a young age, um, in the areas of science and technology, then it's not necessarily seen as something that's appropriate for or for Maori and students. I I think when we come back, athletes are harder. It's become very hard to then encourage a child to yeah. physics if they have that. Of them have chosen to take maths to the minimum level, which 
horrifying me, but there wasn't anything I could do about it. They'd done probability stats and that's it, nothing else. Well, and, and the problem with that actually gets deeper when you're dealing with impoverished school systems. In, in the state of Illinois, where I live in the United States, we, one of the problems we have communities where there might only be 60 or 100 students attending the secondary school. And the teachers are paid 20 something thousand dollars a year. The school system has less than $20 per student for supplies. They can't buy paper. And the school simply doesn't have the resources, the means, the textbook, the educated teachers to teach anything beyond the algebra too. Well, to get into the university, you need calculus for some of the best universities in the United States. So because these students have the misfortune of being born into an impoverished area of the country, they don't have the opportunities in public school to take the science classes and take the mathematics classes necessary to attain the highest levels of university education. It's not their fault. Question over here. I did a career as an Um, there are not. <laughs> there, there's a YouTube video that Kylie will let me touch her keyboard. Um, actually, she can touch her own keyboard. There's a YouTube video that, that goes over the statistics of people getting careers with STEM education and what fields they go into, and it turns out that more people go into liberal arts than go into STEM careers once they have a STEM education, which means that my astrophysics degree has completely qualified me to be a voice actress, which is plan D for my grants one out. Don't you take this slide, we talk a lot about science education. I'm particularly interested in the adult population who are voting and things like referendums on fluoridation of the water supply, that sort of thing. And the science literacy of those people probably said something interesting that in Australia, while a lot of people aren't very science literate, when they survey them about their appreciation of science, a lot of them can link it to things like economic development. And we don't measure science literacy in New Zealand, but we do measure the appreciation of science, and it's generally very high in New Zealand. And one of the things that's very high in New Zealand is trust in scientists. But I wonder, I mean, you know, Susan's on the front page of the Herald today talking about Clostridium botulinum, an issue that's really, I think, shaken uh, New Zealanders' faith in our ability to have robust science underpinning some of our really important industries. How important do you think to the trust is in, in scientists and the perception of scientists? Very. <laughs> and actually, one of the things I've been really nervous about with the Fonterra story, um, so the quote today, I knew, so actually it happened last night when we were at the Skeptics Dinner, I got called by a Herald journalist to talk about the latest development in the story. And as soon as something came out of my I knew that was going to be a quote he used. And it was basically, it was, so it was talking about ag researchers' data, which was a very small number of animals were injected with this, what they were worried about. Um, and they didn't seem to do any controls, and my big thing is about controls. And what I said was, if a student brought this data to me, I would throw them out of my office. And as soon as I knew that, I thought, oh, shit. Because I'm actually, I'm not criticizing, in, in none of the things I've done that I criticize my research. And the last thing we want to do is criticize one of our CRIs, right? Um, because actually, what they could have done was limited by what they were asked to do and what they were paid to do. And so what this whole story, I wanted it to be, was actually, how science literate are our big companies? Where are the scientists? You know, when the story first broke, when Fonterra first said this was happening, who were the scientists they talked to to find out how they should play this story? What were the things that people needed to know? Who were the scientists who could give them information? And it doesn't seem like they did that. And so rather than criticizing our science, um, our, our, you know, the, the last thing I want is for everyone to suddenly go, oh, bloody hell, all our, you know, our scientists are shit, and our CRIs and universities are shit, and, you know, instead of saying, actually, what were the companies asking for, and what were they prepared to pay for? And that will determine the kind of data they get. 
And so I'm really, we're really worried now, especially with the quote that I just put in the paper, um, of you know what, how this is going to play out. But the other aspect of this is also um, that there are some things. So again, God, this is really going wrong. But there are some things that are broken in science, right? There are some people, and it's not, it's not worth um, burying as a scientist burying our heads in the sand because there are people who are. Uh, doing science badly, or who are behaving um, unethically, in my opinion. And what's really important is when somebody like me, who does a lot of standing up in the media and supporting science, I am not. I will not allow myself to, to not, you know, to not call this stuff out when it happens, right? Because for me, that we're burying those kinds of stories is is going to affect you believing me when I say something. Right? It's going to affect you uh, trusting me. And so there are some things that are wrong, and I call them out all the time. And, and I would hope that within science we can fix those things. We are not infallible. The story clearly shows that. But there is an aspect of what people are asked to do. And I think that's really important. Just that little bit ranty, sorry. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> One of the great things about science is that you're willing to, to, to speak out. If it wasn't for you and, and people, uh, a couple of other microbiologists, no one would be talking about this issue who was a scientist. The people from Fonterra, from Ag Research, from MPI aren't talking about this. What's, do you get blowback from your colleagues for stepping up and talking? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I am in a very difficult position of being uh, hated by my colleagues for my communication stuff, especially the media stuff. Um, and a part of it is um, I guess now I have a series of journalists who trust me, and they know that when they ask me about a story, even if it's not my exact area of expertise, I will go away and learn it, and be able, I, will, I will search the literature, I will read stuff, I will analyze it, and I will be able to talk coherently about it at 7 a.m. in the morning for three minutes, and they will get the story. And it seems that no matter how much I say, oh, you really should go and talk to this person, because they're an expert. They just come back and they say, yeah, we don't care, because they're not going to be able to explain it as eloquently as you can at 7 a.m. in three minutes. And so this has been kind of, it's kind of nice to be told you to be good at something, but on the other hand, my colleagues hate it, because they think I'm kind of I'm taking all the limelight. <laughs> it's like, as if I asked to be woken up at 7 a.m. in the morning to talk about, of course, we do what to learn. Um, so it's really, and it's, so it's really hard, actually, because they seem to think I'm doing it to, um, pursue my own agenda, as well, which I kind of am, because my own agenda is basically making sure that the stuff that gets out there is correct. You know, that people are not calling Kutsu and Watchline in a virus, that, because that irritates me as a lot of you know. So stuff like that, making sure, I mean, I spent half an hour on the phone with a Herald journalist explaining how experiments worked and what controls were and stuff. And actually, this is the so I'll take this. So we talked, but he asked me how this mouse fire essay works, and I explained it to him. And then at some point, after I'd been kind of, I was trying to explain, I was like, okay, if you don't understand that, then we use kind of analogies of baking, we'll talk about eggs and all sorts of things. And at some point, she says, I have to stop you there. Why was a clostridium infected mouse in the pipes? And I was like, oh, shoot, no, there was no conspiracy. And he got everything completely confused. And so my job was to explain to him, okay, this is what's happened. You know, none of that appeared in the paper. But my job was to explain to him, with no science background, what the science was, right? And that, I think, is really important. And I, it really saddens me that my colleagues don't think that that is important. That they would rather just play the media at their own games, you know, get, they, they don't understand how the system works either. You know, that when a journalist says, I need you to answer this question now, that's kind of all you've got, really. They, they're not gonna come back in two hours because they need to file their story. And so there's a lot that scientists need to learn about how the system works. And the Science Media the Centre doing a fantastic job with that, really. But my colleagues are painting the arse. Okay. <laughs> Carly, do you have some last comments on the microphone before we wrap up? No, I was just going to say, yeah, it sounds like a familiar story, and I'm very glad that there are companies and groups out there and institutions who are stepping up and recognising this because um, I think we were chatting earlier on Twitter in regards to um, in the public or perish attitude that you have to be more about doing the business of science and getting papers out rather than and yet it's so immensely valuable. I was going, I was hesitating about wondering if there might be an agenda-based issue as well in regards to a woman, <laughs> oh yes, in regards to a woman being the one who's uh, been in the media forefront, there might be like, hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
one thing I have had just last week was that I was told by my colleagues that um, they want they wanted a particular story in the newspaper, and they asked me to on the radio. They asked me to use my context to get the story in the radio, and I, so I asked with the radio to run the story. But I've also it was made very clear to me that you can use your context to push the story, but you are not the person to talk about it because we have this series of people who, for political reasons, we need to be the one seen to do it. And this, this is this really interesting thing of, of my colleagues not understanding how this works. Because they, 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 in the end, the radio didn't run the story because they weren't interested. Because they, you know, and yet my colleagues were really annoyed with me. So, oh, he obviously didn't do a good enough job. Okay. And then it turned out all the people they wanted to talk to were all Muslim anyway. So it's kind of funny that I ended up being the one talking because everyone else wasn't allowed to talk. But it's amazing how, and I just wonder whether, I don't know, being careful and whether that's just, they irritates them. I'm not sure. Or just a gobby woman. You know, I am getting the reputation of being kind of rent to but it's there, it's still like, okay. Don't you dare be dominant. No. <laughs> so, so my hair isn't always unusual colours. And the story I'm about to tell was from prior, from a period of time when I had dark brown hair, as opposed to whatever colour this comes out on any given morning. Um, I, I was invited to give a talk that happens to me so often, and I don't remember where it was, other than it wasn't in America, which again happens so often they can't remember. But one of my colleagues down the hallway, for whatever reason, flagged in for like the first time ever that I was getting invited to go somewhere and give a talk. Older, gray haired, bald individual. And he comes flying out of his office in a huff. And he actually tried to convince the chair of the department to somehow like contact the conference organizers, get my invitation to give the talk, and he's a physicist and I'm an astronomer, and it was an astronomy talk, to get my invitation to give the talk retracted so that he could go give it because really this was something a senior person needed to do. And seriously, what's wrong with a young female being qualified to go to foreign country and give a talk on her field of research. And this is what we deal with sometimes. And people who are public communicators of science are somehow, we're, we're distracting ourselves from doing proper research. Therefore, we must not be proper researchers. Now we simply realize that there's a need to educate the public because if someone doesn't educate the public, the public will pay the money that is used by the people who do nothing but research to their research. So rather than yelling at me from your laboratory door, please say thank you because you're getting taxpayer money as I talk to your taxpayers. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> one very quick final comment. Uh, one quick anecdotal thing which I had to edit out of the podcast interview I did with Professor Brian Cox because I kind of burst into tears when I said to him, how come there has to be a female Brian Cox? Why can't there just be Female doing it then. No, 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 I understand you. It's cool. It's okay. It's okay. It's alright. His wife was next to me and yeah, she's cool. So, yeah. She's awesome. Gia Malinovic, yeah. Check her work out. Seriously. Gia Malinovic. I'll pop a link on the wall. Can we go? I have to read the thing as well. The same thing happened to Carl Sagan. Like, yeah. I mean, at least three or four years in the just male who've had much the same kind of problems. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to talk about this in my talk tomorrow. Wikipedia, there's people doing it for uh, Project Data, putting women's names out there, involved in science and so forth. It should be done for skeptics, it certainly should be done for women in science, getting Wikipedia entrance for them, because one of the first things we do when we're researching scientists, especially young people, is hop onto Wikipedia and start typing in those names. So building up a database of Wikipedia skeptics and certainly women in science on Wikipedia is something that we want to Because, yeah, the entry for Carl Sagan may be this level. Uh, the entry for us, uh, and Lewin, um, his wife, you know, I'm sure. So, so dealing with that in balance is one great thing to do. Okay, now we need to make way for our psychics, so um, give it up for our panel.